everybody, and thank you and for joining us. Welcome to our Ask the Expert event. Today, we're going to be learning about what birds are up to in the fall, and we're going to be talking to expert David Sibley. I'm Craig Lamolt. Uh, I'm a reporter here at GBH News, and I'm also something of a bird enthusiast. I want to thank everybody for joining us today, including our leadership circle and our Ralph Lowell Society members. We really appreciate your continued and generous support. Before we get started, I just want to say, unlike us, we won't be able to see you uh, on the video um, or hear you, uh, but we do want your questions. So if you have a question you want to ask David Sibley, uh, open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and just type it in. Uh, as always, we'd love to know where you're tuning in from, so please let us know uh, where you're watching the event from. Also, this is so important. If you see a question that somebody else has asked that you would like the answer to, please upvote it because those... Uh, Questions that get the most upvotes go to the top of the screen, and we're most likely to get to those. There are a lot of people joining us today, and we're so excited to hear your questions. I apologize in advance if we don't get to all of them, but please upvote the ones that you're most interested in hearing David answer, and we'll make sure to get to those for sure. Also, want to let you know if you'd like a closed captioning feature, you can find the uh, you can click on the live transcript button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, on my screen, it's listed under more. If you click that, you get live transcript. There's two different options. Uh, we should recommend you can select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also choose full transcript, and a sidebar window is going to open up, and you'll see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind uh, there's a, a slight delay, I think, on on those uh, transcriptions. But without further ado, I want to uh, introduce David Sibley. Uh, David Allen Sibley is the author and illustrator of a series of successful guides to nature that bears name, including the Sibley Guide to Birds. I think mine, mine's right up there. I think I'm sure you all have them on your bookshelves as well. Uh, he's contributed to Smithsonian, Science, the Wilson Journal of Ornithology, Birding, Birdwatching, North American Birds, and the New York Times. He's recipient of the Roger Tory Peterson Award for Lifetime Achievement from the American Birding Association uh, and the Linnaean Society of, uh, of New York's uh, Eisenman Medal. Uh, and he lives and birds here in Massachusetts. David, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Craig. It's great to be back. It's, it's really great to see you and to talk to you. You know, and it's fun to do this in the fall. I think, you know, there's really no better time to go for a walk in the woods in New England in the fall, you know, you get these beautiful crisp days, leaves are changing, but there's also a lot of bird activity, right? I mean, yeah. can you get, give us a, a sense of what we should be looking for? What's out there right now? Are, are a lot of birds migrating through? Like what, what, should we, what should we keep an eye out for right now? Yeah, this, it's an incredibly active time of year and there's a lot going on. Well, there's, there's always a lot going on in the bird world, but this, this is a very busy time. And, in general, birds are heading south. And some species have been heading south since late June. Some fall migration begins that early. Birds are finished nesting and they're starting to move south. Um, now, most of the insect eating birds have already left us um, because this is the time of year when there could be a hard frost any time that would wipe out the insects that the birds need to eat. So, all these songbirds have evolved a timing that, that gets them out of Massachusetts well, before the insects disappear. Right. So they're mostly gone. It's a lot of sparrows now, and there'll be waves of sparrows and blackbirds and, and robins and um, some other species moving south over the next month. Well, and ducks, geese, um, seabirds, those are the things that'll be the, the bulk of the migration over the next month. Are they, do they, do anything to prepare? Are they busy getting ready for what's going to be a, a pretty epic flight? Yeah, it depends on the species. And some species make really epic flights like black pole warbler that takes off from the coast of Massachusetts and flies nonstop to South America. So they, they make a lot of preparations for that. But all the birds are at this time of year, the, even the sparrows, they migrate at night. So after flying all night, they need to um, get a lot of food, find water, take care of their feathers and rest a little bit, but they don't sleep very much. And then in a night or two, they're taking off again and flying a few hundred miles farther south. Um, so it's a very busy time, lots of preparations. Um, and they're all, all the birds this time of year, well, first there's all the young birds are out. So the, the total population of birds that's moving south is much bigger than the number of birds that came north in the spring. Um, and a lot of them won't survive the coming year, but 
Um, but right now, the bird population is is at a very high level. So you'll see a lot more birds than you do in the spring. And they're all in their very fresh fall plumage. They've just finished molting. They've got brand new feathers ready for the fall migration and the winter when they need good insulation. So I think they're really looking their best this time of year, really crisp and subtle shadings of colors and neatly trimmed feathers. It's uh, uh, looking very good. When you go out in October for a walk, what, what are you looking for? What are you, what are you most trying to, to spot? Um, you know, whenever I go out, I'm just looking for uh, any bird that is, uh, that is cooperative, <laughs> any bird that will sit still and let me watch it. And as I watch or as I walk around, I listen to things and, and watch birds and I'll, I'll um, think of something, some question that I'd like to answer and, and try to sort that out, looking at some of the birds. Um, looking at you no know, variation in colors or patterns or calls, mm -hmm. um, differences between males and females. So it just each, each morning I go out usually without a specific goal, but find something along the way that piques my interest. Great. You know, one of the things that we like to do actually that my wife's really into doing when we go for a walk uh, is to to pick up you know the feathers that she sees along the way. And we have I actually have a a bowl full of her feathers here yes. that, that, she, that she's kept. And the, the problem is oftentimes we don't, we don't know what bird these feathers are from. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, could I, could I show you a couple? Would you, would you be able to, to maybe tell me, uh, are you able to identify sure. the bird by looking at a feather? Um, often I can, yes. And, and at least get some general idea of what it's from, yep. All right, let me, let me, this, how about uh, this? Ah. That I would guess is from a red-tailed hawk. Really? Um, yeah, and probably one of the big. Um, so it's a pretty big feather. Um, well, I should actually start by um, giving a little a little public service announcement that technically it's illegal to possess um, feathers like that. Um, the migratory bird. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Sorry to say, technically, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that has been in the news recently because the Biden administration just restored a lot of the protections that the Trump administration had, had uh, uh, reinterpreted. Um, but anyway, it, it was, the law was made at the time when, when the feather trade was still fresh in people's right. minds and the killing of birds just for their feathers, just for fashion to put feathers on hats or right. other ornament ornamentation. And so, um, so it's illegal to possess any part of a protected bird, including feathers, because even if you found it on the ground, there's no way of knowing that. You could have, you know, someone could, uh, you know, be killing blue jays and selling the feathers. Um, and that's what got us into the feather trade issue 140, 30 years ago. So yeah. anyway, I say technically it's illegal and I can't. I can't give you permission. I think that for, for the average <laughs> hobbyist bird lover, everyone picks up feathers and it's fine to pick them up and look at them. Um, it's illegal to possess them, to have them in your house, to have a collection of them. And I I'm don't know how. Very don't know how glad often to that's, know this. Thank you how for often this information. That's prosecuted. I didn't realize that this is, this is a contraband <laughs> that I have, I have here. <laughs> Uh, I know, actually, in addition, like in addition to hats, I, I, there was a story uh, I heard years ago about um, uh, people tying uh, ties for uh, fishing, fly fishing. Um, that there's yes. a there's a, tr a trade in in very rare bird feathers for that as well. Yeah, a book called "The Feather Thief" that came out a few years ago is a, yeah. a, all about that. This incredible story of a young young uh, uh, up and coming fly tire who snuck into the British Museum and stole a bunch of really valuable specimens of even some extinct birds, irreplaceable yeah. specimens, and uh, used the feathers to tie flies um, and was never prosecuted. Um, they, they couldn't somehow, you'll have to read the book, but uh, I hope I didn't give away too much there. But um, <laughs> Well, I, I promise that that's not what we're doing with these feathers. 
Uh, I did yes. say, by the way, it was my wife that picks them up, not me. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to show you one more here. Uh, okay. What, what is this? Any idea? That is a blue jay. The blue. And the I would have guessed a blue jay just from the color, but okay. Thank yeah. you for that. So uh, that right, we have. I, I want to get to listener questions or the, the viewer questions rather, because um, we have a ton already. There's a lot of people joining us. Again, if you have a question, go ahead, put it in the Q and A tab. Also, upvote the ones that you most want the answers to, because we're going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, and I'm just going to jump in with some of these questions. Um, so, uh, question that Nancy would like to know. She says, "Are you aware of any specific threats to our eastern birds due to climate change? If so, what are they, and what can we do about it?" Important question. Yeah, that's a big question and very important. Um, so the yeah, many threats. The um, uh, let's see, for probably the you know, there's habitat is going to change. The forest is going to change as the climate warms. It's already changing. The seasons are shifting. Spring is a little earlier. Fall is a little later. Um, so migratory birds. Some migratory birds are having a hard time um, staying in sync with the, the seasons. The, the resident species like chickadees can time their nesting cycle based on what's happening around them. They can react to the signals that are happening in the forest around them. But a migratory bird like say a red-eyed vireo that's coming from South America, it has no clue while it's on its wintering grounds in South America that spring is coming early. So it's mm. just migrating based on the timing, the instinctive timing that has worked for hundreds or thousands of years. And they arrive here a little bit late for the, to be in sync with the, the emergence of insects. And, and uh, there's evidence that their nesting, um, nests have been a little bit less successful because of that, but they are shifting gradually, um, not quite as quickly as the uh, as the seasons are advancing, but but the birds are shifting their migration schedules. And that's um, one of the things I think is really a hopeful sign is that the birds are so adaptable um, and quick to adjust to these things that most birds I think will, will adapt, even though climate change is coming quickly. Um, the species that won't be able to adapt are um, in particular um, coastal birds, the species like piping plover, salt marsh sparrow that live their whole lives and build their nests within a few inches of the high tide line. Mm -hmm. And as tides get higher, it means that the spring storms, some early summer storms will be a little bit higher. Um, nests could get washed out. And there isn't, as the sea level rises, um, there isn't a place for those birds to move into. Um, it's not like they can move higher up the beach there is a point where they'll just run out of space. Um, and so those are probably the most immediately threatened species. Um, okay. The solution is, a, it's a big international political solution as I'm sure everyone knows is the, the real solution to climate change, greenhouse gases. So, um, but doing your part in your own life um, is good, reducing your, um, reducing your fossil fuel use, um, uh, switching to solar power, electric cars, um, all those th things will make a, a difference and also help to promote those, those changes that everyone needs to make. So, yeah. uh, but yes, it's a big, uh, it's a very big uh, issue that is uh, gonna take some big solutions. Okay, okay. Um... I love this question uh, from Carolyn, because this is something I've been wondering about as well. She says, is it safe to feed birds now? Should I be washing bird feeders with a bleach solution? I know there was a, there was a disease that, uh, that was spread and the, the state said, please bring in your bird feeders, don't have them out. That is, I think, been lifted now, right? Is, what, what is Carolyn's question, is it safe to do yeah. it now? And, and is bleach a good idea? Yeah, it is. Um, all that is true. Um, there was a, a disease, uh, something was uh, killing birds in the mid-Atlantic states mostly and the Midwest um, in the summer. Um, it's still unknown what that was and it might have uh -huh. been several things together and it wasn't particularly related to bird feeders. Um, the 
recommendation to take down bird feeders was simply a way to try to force the birds to do some social distancing themselves so that the, if the disease was here, that it wouldn't spread so easily. Uh, as birds congregate at feeders, it's a place where, where disease can spread. So that was the thinking behind the bird feeder. Um, and we band. can't get them to wear masks. <laughs> no, no. Um, and um, so they, uh, so it's still a mystery what that was, um, whether it was a disease or a toxin or some other kind of um, issue. Um, and it seems to have stopped in, the, in that area and it never really reached Massachusetts. Um, so yes, it's safe to put bird feeders back out, but you right. should always at any time, just keep an eye on your feeders. And if you see birds that are looking a little ill, which usually the sign of that is they're all puffed up and just sitting. If one bird just sits on a perch on the feeder for minutes at a time and doesn't really react when other birds try to land near it and it's got its feathers all puffed up and its eyes closed, that's a sick bird. And um, to, keep, um, to keep other birds away and, and try to prevent that disease from spreading, taking down your bird feeders is a good idea then and cleaning them, if you can fill a big wash basin or a garbage can or something with a 10% bleach solution and just dunk the feeders in there and okay. brush them out, get them really clean and, um, and then let them dry out and refill them in a week or two and put them back up. Um, that's the recommended procedure for that situation. And, and that's always the case if you, um, and so, uh, having nothing to do with the, the, what was happening in the mid-Atlantic this summer. Um, it's safe to put brood feeders back out and it's good to clean them with bleach once in a while and keep okay. an eye out for sick birds. Great, like a 10% solution. That's good to know. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Nancy who at, says, uh, she says, I've discovered the fascinating app Merlin from Cornell. I've been using it to identify calls for the last couple of months. Uh, I have no decent search image for birds, however, uh, and can't confirm the IDs visually. I've been dumbfounded by the diversity uh, ID in the woods around my house, and it, it's not Mockingbird, she says. How reliable is that <laughs> app? I get the impression it's very accurate. Is that true? Are, are you familiar with the app that she's talking about? I am. I'm familiar with it. I haven't used it very much myself, and it's, it's, but it is quite accurate. Um, but having said that, um, it... Um, it does make plenty of mistakes. Um, I think it might be something like 90% accurate, um, which means one out of 10 identifications is wrong. Um, it's amazing that a, a smartphone app can do that, um, but still it's not, not really reliable enough to... Um, uh, no, for sure. You know, I, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't um, just give a blanket acceptance to all the identifications that you get from Merlin. It's also relying a lot on um, uh, expectation, which all birders do, <laughs> we all do it naturally. It's a, a big part of the, the rapid identification, but, but Merlin is using the, the data that it has on, on what's expected in that area at that time mm -hmm. of year. And so it's likely to miss, to actually miss a lot of rare species because they're, it's gonna prefer the identification of common species. Um, and at the same time, I've seen some cases people have reported where Merlin is identifying um, very rare species for Massachusetts. Um, so anyway, it's, um, yeah, it's a great learning tool, a great, um, starting point and it will do a, probably do a really good job on well the better the recording you have and and the more distinctive the sound the better it mm -hmm. will do so it'll do really well on a, a strong recording of a tufted titmouse song or something like that which is what most people will find in their backyards if it's just a short little chip note of where where 30 species make a similar sound, it's right. less likely to get that right. 
Okay. So as okay. a starting That's... point for for beginners to learn the learn the common bird songs in your backyard, I think it's a fantastic tool. That's great because I that's a challenge I've had. I I I just I feel like I don't know birds by their their song, and I'm going to try that app. That sounds terrific. Um, yeah. I'll give it a shot. Um, Betsy wants to know another question that I've been wondering. She says, "Do you clean out your birdhouses in fall or leave them?" for winter birds. I have one that no one ever actually moved into in the spring because I think I put it out too late. And now I'm thinking, do I take it in and put it back out, you know, uh, at the end of the winter or early spring or, or do I leave it? Are, are winter birds going to move in there? Yeah, it's a, you know, I, I clean out my birdhouses in the spring before the birds come back. Um, but I've seen mixed kind of mixed reports. I, I read a study recently about, um, so one of the thoughts is that birds birds prefer to use a birdhouse that's empty, that's clean, because an old nest, there's a possibility that the nesting material in that old nest would still be infested with feather lice or some other parasites. So the birds are more likely to choose a fresh box where they can build a new nest. But someone actually did a study looking at parasites and old versus new nests and found there's really no difference Hmm. And, and that the birds didn't really show a preference. Um, so it might, and it, I think the, the preferences might go species to species to some extent. There might be differences, like bluebirds might prefer one, one way and wrens another. Um, well, I know with, with house wrens, <laughs> you have to clean out the box because they keep stuffing more sticks in and it eventually just gets so full, there's no room for the nest in there anymore so um i you know cleaning them out i think it's a good idea and you're not doing any harm the birds they're even if they go into a box with an old nest in it they're going to build something new on top of that um, so there's no harm in in taking everything out and giving the birds a, a fresh box to start with my neighbor had quite a lot of cleaning up to do from her dryer vent, which I think it was the wrens who, uh, who took a liking to and, and, and built some nests in there. They'll, <laughs> oh, yeah. They're uh, crafty that way. Um, question from, from Milton, who says, we saw a large number of great egrets in the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge in Newburyport, Mass, uh, yesterday. Uh, are egrets this far north a new phenomenon, or have they always been here? Um, well, it's a... Uh... Depends how you define new. <laughs> They've been coming north. They come north this time of year. They, well, there's some that nest in Massachusetts. They nest on an island just north of Boston. Um, uh, at least a few dozen, I think, there. And um, there are colonies scattered along the coast south of here. So there are some that nest here, but much bigger numbers come north in the late summer. And that's, it's common to all of those, the fish eating water birds, um, herons, herons, egrets, um, storks, spoonbills, those last two don't usually get this far north, um, but they do move north in the late summer to take advantage of the abundance of fish that are there um, without a lot of uh, herons and egrets and other predators eating them. So. Um, much bigger numbers nest in the southeast. Um, there's a lot of competition for fish there. The smaller numbers nesting here. So the southern birds, after they finish nesting or the young have fledged, they move north to where there's less competition for the fish that are here. So that phenomenon has been going on for um, hundreds or thousands of years. Um, it really was greatly diminished by the, um, uh, the feather trade 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, heron egrets, especially great egret and snowy egret, were the two species that were most sought after for their feathers, and their really? populations were were extremely low. Yeah, nearly I would have thought extinct. it'd be a more colorful bird that would be more sought after. No, it was the lacy plumes, these very lacy, delicate plumes on the backs of these egrets. Mm -hmm. um, they're so so delicate, and and. Um, so those were really um, much in demand. And the egrets, both species were nearly extinct in the US um, 120 years ago um, when, when uh, uh, feather, the feather trade was outlawed. So for 
50 years after that, they were extremely rare and not showing up in Massachusetts. Um, so there's probably someone, uh, there might be someone listening today who remembers a time when seeing a great egret in Massachusetts was a big deal. Um, but they, uh, they've come back in really good numbers. And uh, now every summer we get pretty good numbers in Massachusetts. And they'll stay until, until it's, the water starts to freeze and then uh, race back south. Okay, great, great. Um, Phil would like to know when birds migrate at night, what time do they typically fly? And most importantly, how much before daylight do they land? He says, I ask because uh, I check winds on peak migration nights and wonder what happens towards morning. Yeah, so they, they're taking off not long after sunset usually um, and flying for most of the night. Um, and they'll drop in, um, I think, you know, when I spent a lot of time at Cape May, New Jersey, which is a kind of a funnel shaped peninsula that sticks off the southern end of New Jersey, and birds would get there, um, they would be flying south. And they could tell even at night that they were reaching the end of the land, that they were surrounded by water. So birds there would drop out of the sky all night long and just search for shelter in the, in the brush, mm -hmm. in the trees. Um, but generally over land, I think they're flying until dawn, near dawn, and then dropping, dropping down out of the sky and looking for some shelter, some place where they can safely spend the day and find food and water. So it's, a, it's an eight hour um, flight, say starting at 9 p.m. and dropping in at 5 a.m. when it's just, you know, just the first glimmer of twilight. Um, so yeah, it's a long, a long night of flying and no sleep. Um, it just sounds exhausting. It's amazing that they can do it and, and the distances they travel I don't know, it's just, it's staggering when I think about it. Yeah, yeah, and there was a study a few years ago of white crowned sparrow, which is a common, there's some in Massachusetts in the fall and, and it's very similar to all the other sparrows. Their sleep patterns change completely this time of year. So while they're migrating, they're flying all night, so not sleeping, and all day mm -hmm. they have to feed and drink and um, uh, take care of their feathers and get ready for the next big flight. And so during this time, they're sleeping only a total of about two hours a day. Wow. All that in little cat naps, <laughs> bird <Yeah>. naps. <laughs> and then- So not, not continual, it's, it's, it's broken up. Yeah, it's just little five minute, 10 minute naps. Hmm. And then um, when they get to their wintering grounds, they shift to a standard fall asleep when it gets dark and wake up when it gets light. And they do that on the breeding grounds also in the summer when they're resident there and then switch for six or eight weeks. They're on this two hours of short naps every day, every 24 hour period. And the researchers said that the more, more research is needed. They have no idea how these birds, which are really advanced, you know, they've got a really advanced brain, they're high, higher vertebrates that how they can control their sleep cycles that way. We would not be able to function after a few days of just uh, naps, short naps totaling two hours. And these birds are doing it for weeks at a time and then just switching back to their normal sleep cycle. So uh, a lot of sleep mysteries involved with migration. And I read in, in, your, in, in this book here actually that you, you wrote about how they can actually hold on to branches while sleeping right like that's a yes. they, there's a, a system for that yeah so they well first of all they don't birds probably don't really sleep um quite the way we do they can sleep with just half of their brain at a time right. so put one side to sleep the other side is alert enough to uh, be ready to uh, escape from any danger or adjust their balance on their perch and yeah they they just balance on a twig while they sleep. And one of the things that helps them do that is apparently an, an extra balance sensor in their pelvis where we have a balance sensor in our inner ear 
And um, in our head, birds have that also. But if they're, um, you know, they're sitting on a branch and they're moving their head around, they might be preening. Um, if we, you know, try standing on one leg, I will be careful if you're trying this. <laughs> standing on one leg and swinging, spinning your head around from side to side, you'll lose your balance. Yeah. Um, because your balance sensor is in here in your ear and, uh, and it's moving around. Um, but the birds can do that and, and still maintain their balance because in their pelvis in their is pelvis. another balance sensor. I love it. I just think it's fascinating. I think it's great. Uh, I want to get back to some questions here. Um, Donna wants to know what the best time to start feeding the birds again for the winter is in Massachusetts. Um, well, anytime, anytime now. Many people feed year round, and I, I do generally. And that's, um, uh, uh, you know, if you're in an area where there's uh, potential for bears, and that's actually most of Massachusetts, you have to be really careful. Um, it's, it's actually, the state recommends not feeding in the summer um, because of bears and, uh, and bear season runs a long time. Um, so um, if, uh, uh, but yes, there's nothing wrong, as far as the birds are concerned, there's nothing wrong with feeding year round. Um, they, they benefit from uh, food year round. You'll, you'll get lots of activity and, um, uh, and birds, wintering birds are already coming back now, white-throated sparrows and juncos and, and the goldfinches, house finches, all the species that will be around for the winter. Um, and many of them are resident like chickadees and titmice. Um, they're here now and, and would be happy to have bird feeders. And I think I, I'm gonna ask the, the obvious follow-up question is, which is what do you feed them with in, in the fall and in the winter? And does it change throughout the year? No, I've, I've, I feed the same thing um, all the time. It's uh, whole hmm. sunflower seeds or sunflower chips. Um, I find that it, it attracts the widest variety of birds. Basically every species likes that food. It's very high in um, fat content. And, um, uh, um, and it's, it's a little more expensive than other foods and more expensive than the black oil sunflower seeds which still have the shells on but it, but um the shells of the black oil sunflower seeds if you're feeding a lot of birds you'll end up with big piles of shells on the ground yeah that need yeah. to be cleaned up um and it, it kills other plants under the feeders and yep. so on so um plus you're you're paying for the weight of the shells when you buy that food by the pound so <laughs> so the, the sunflower chips are, are what I what I feed. I found that's the the birds love it and it's uh, it's easy to maintain. Um, Claire wants to know, this is a great question. What do you consider the most important foundations, scientific, mathematical, cultural, that a young person needs to pursue a career in ornithology? What's your advice for a young person uh. Uh, going into the field? Oh, that's a good question, but I think um, you know ornithology. Um, it's a. It sounds like a very narrow, <laughs> very specific field, but it's really incredibly broad. Um, it just means studying something involving birds and people. Ornithologists take it in many different directions, the same way bird watchers take bird watching in many different directions. You can study bird songs, but even there you can study the singing behavior, watching birds in the field or, or the uh, kind of technical um, aspects of the sounds. Um, so I think the, the most important foundation is just curiosity and being excited about birds um, and like any other science, a uh, sort of um, uh, pattern recognition, um, the the ability and the and the desire to sort things out and put them 
put things into patterns into a into a system to figure all that out um mm -hmm. i think that's what makes someone a scientist and the and the curiosity the the joy of discovery the the pleasure of that eureka moment where you say oh this piece goes here um that's uh and then whatever um you know you can study ornithology that's with a lot of math or without a lot of math or with um uh, working with sounds or working with working with watching bird behavior in the field or applied conservation it could involve um, you know right now there's a lot of work with um, wind turbines alternative energy that kind of stuff or agriculture and birds there's so many different directions you can take it um, but I think just the just being excited about birds is the uh, the foundation i hope that's, that's not too one. too vague an answer but i think that's really the the key you gotta have that for sure to be or that's um fantastic questions from the audience so many great questions we have a lot more that we're going to get to as well but i want to take a quick moment to introduce my colleague sandy hey sandy hi craig thank you so much and thank you to all of you for being here this afternoon while learning about fall birding with author and birding expert, David Allen Sibley in today's Ask the Expert event. Viewers and listeners turn to GBH for many reasons, whether it's to experience something new, to learn the latest headlines and local stories, or to simply be entertained. And if GBH is your go-to source for culture, news, and entertainment, then please consider making a donation. Today, when you give $7.50 a month as a GBH sustainer, or $90 all at once as our thank you, we'll send you a signed copy of David Sibley's book, What It's Like to Be a Bird. His book gives you, birders and non-birders alike, fascinating information with answers to all kinds of questions of what common, mostly backyard birds are doing and why. And all of this with over 300 of Sibley's gorgeous illustrations. Visit gbh.org slash support events to see David's book and more, or to make your gift in any amount today. And simply click on the support link in the chat tab now, or text GBH to 800-204-3811. You can also scan the QR code located right here on your screen. Giving takes just a few minutes of your time and a few dollars on your credit card. And if you're already a GBH member, thank you so much for your support. And if you wish to become one today, just click on the link in the chat tab now, or text GBH to 800-204-3811 to make that gift. And now, Craig, let's get back to all our curious members at home to learning more about fall birding with our expert, David Allen Sibley. Great, thank you so much, Sandy. And as I mentioned, I have, uh, David, I absolutely love this book. And it's just like, it's actually, it's different from a lot of your books because some of the illustrations are just these huge, beautiful illustrations with all these facts about, you know, just, just interesting things about what birds do and how they do it and why they do it. I really, it's, I've learned a lot from it. So thank you, David, for that. And also I think it's wonderful thank that you. if people make a, a donation to GBH uh, today that they can actually get a, a signed copy of, of this amazing book. It's really gorgeous. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, I just want to jump right back in with some questions. We have a lot more questions and I want to get as many of them as in as we can before uh, our time runs out here. Harvey says the Hummers born at our place in Clinton, Missouri, uh, are all females. How could that be? Uh, um, well, there's a chance, and it's a 50-50 chance. So the, it's like the odds of flipping a coin and getting any number of heads in a row. So it could happen. Um, but I would also say that the young hummingbirds all look like females. The males don't get their bright red throat and blackish head until um, the spring or about February, March. That's when they'll molt and grow new feathers um, that, so they'll look like an adult male. So this time of year, all of the young ones, males and females, look very similar to the uh, adult okay. females. Um, so unless you're looking very carefully and distinguishing the immature males from the, from the females, um, that might be what's going on then. Uh, 
you might you, all of, all of your young hummingbirds do generally look like females. That explains it. That's great. That's great. And you know, I don't have a hummingbird feeder here. I would love to have hummingbirds. And I think it's it's a matter of patience, right? It takes a while for them to really figure out that you're you're there and they want to come to you. Yeah, it's you know, hummingbirds are kind of uh, they live in most of Massachusetts, and and if you just put up a feeder, um, eventually a hummingbird will drop by, and if if there's nesting nearby, they might uh, make regular visits. If you can put up a a good sized flower garden, or even just a few potted um, flowering plants like some sage or something, bright red flowers are most attractive to them. Um, a little bit, a little flower garden will really add to the attraction. And hummingbirds mm -hmm. that are just flying by will see that and swing in to take a look. And they have an incredible memory of all the flowers they've ever visited. And because most most of the flowers that are um, adapted to be pollinated by hummingbirds are, they're mostly tubular flowers, long flowers, so the hummingbird's <laughs> bill fits in, and they're red mostly, and they're perennial, which means that the hummingbirds can remember where the plant was and come back to it year after year, and they do that. Um, anyone who's, who has hummingbird feeders for multiple years will know that the first, when the first hummingbird comes back in the spring, it often sits in the yard and hovers in the spot where the hummingbird feeder was the previous year. Just they know the exact spot in the air where the hummingbird feeder used to hang and they'll hover there waiting for it. So once you get one visiting feeders, you can, you can expect it to keep coming back. Um, it'll remember the spot and keep visiting. That's so great. I would love to get them here. Um, on this topic, actually, Betsy wants to know, have they left New England uh, already and should you take her hummingbird feeder in yet? Yeah, they have left. Um, okay. the, the males leave around September 1st, the adult males, um, and the, then the females and immatures stick around until about September 20th, 25th is when the very last ones are usually leaving. And there's still a few around very few around and this time of year um, if you see a hummingbird it's there's a some significant percentage of the hummingbirds that are still around this time of year are uh, vagrants from the west they're rare western species like rufous hummingbird um, hmm. off course and making their way who knows where but um, many bird watchers and hummingbird um, uh, fans like to leave their feeders up even into November um, because you might be uh, the lucky lucky homeowner who gets one of these very rare hummingbirds to visit. Um, it's important okay. still, especially this in the weather we've been having, it's relatively warm. It's important to still change the sugar water every couple of days to make sure it stays fresh. Okay. Um, but yeah, lots of people leave hummingbird feeders up even after the ruby-throated hummingbirds are gone, just hoping for that one, one straggler. Okay. Um, Sharon wants to know what type of shelter or birdhouse uh, do cardinals best respond to in the winter months? They don't use any shelter. They, they wouldn't go into a birdhouse. Most birds oh, wow. don't. And um, yeah, and even the birds that nest in birdhouses, most of them won't go into a birdhouse in the winter. Um, they use it strictly for nesting. Um, but cardinals nest, they'll just build a cup nest in a shrub. And, um, and in the winter, they, they, the shelter that they need is a nice um, thick tangle of branches. That's where they'll sleep. So they'll go into a dense shrub. Uh, they really like the, some of the ornamental shrubs like arborvitae or um, okay. uh, rhododendron. And they'll just kind of snuggle in there on, in some little tangle of branches where they're not easily visible and they're sheltered from the wind and maybe from rain or snow fall, falling from above. And that's where they'll spend the night. You know, I mentioned my, no one ever moved into my birdhouse, um, but I put it out, I was still building it. So actually it went up too late. It took me too long. Mm -hmm. um, but when do I need to get it? If, if I do take it down this winter, which I think I might just to kind of protect it, um, when do I need, need to get it back up by? Is March the right time? Is it too late or when do I go? 
Yeah, um, I think, you know, March 1st or even in February isn't too early. Um, okay. Bluebirds are, um, and I don't know if you have bluebirds in your neighborhood, but they're, um, they start looking at nest boxes very early. They're, they're around through the winter in many parts of Massachusetts and they'll start checking out nest sites very early in the spring or even late winter. Um, other species like house wrens and tree swallows, they'll arrive, tree swallows arrive in, in March, um, even early March. House wrens arrive in the middle of April, say. Um, so those other species are arriving a little bit later, but, but there's, uh, there's no, need, no reason to wait. I would put the birdhouse out early in February. Okay, I'll do that for sure, thanks. Um, Jacqueline says, I lived in a neighborhood where turkeys took over. Uh, why did they seem to appear suddenly like that in, in, in such numbers a few years ago? Uh, was it habitat disruption? disruption? Uh, she says, like Ben Franklin, uh, I find them fascinating. Uh, and and I, I share that with, with Jacqueline. They're, they're pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, they're a fantastic bird. And I, I grew up in Connecticut. And, and in the 1970s, we made a special trip 40 miles or so to go to northwestern Connecticut to see some turkeys that had been transplanted from somewhere south and west. Um, they were wiped out, completely extirpated from Massachusetts in the 1700s, I think. They were um, uh, gone from Massachusetts for a long, long time. And um, uh, just recently, um, through the efforts of, of um, government agencies that they were trying, trying to reintroduce turkeys to reestablish them in all the places where they had been previously. And, and I know they, I'm sure those people never dreamed that they would have as much success as they've had now. Um, but turkeys, uh, you know, there's somehow, there's some, something clicked and they, they are able to survive in the suburbs and they yeah. like the suburbs. Um, there's no hunting. There's no very few predators. Um, they don't have to worry about house cats. Um, they're bigger than <laughs> bigger than the cats, and um, they just have taken over the suburbs. And it happened very quickly, just in the last twenty years. Yeah. Um, and so it's not. Um, it's not that something bad is happening somewhere else in their range that's forcing them into the suburbs. It's just that they've, they have found the suburbs to their liking and, and they're thriving. Um, there's actually, I live in Deerfield, Massachusetts in the central Western part of the state. And we mm -hmm. rarely see turkeys there, hmm. but back in Concord, Cambridge. <laughs> those oh, all the time. Parts. I mean, they're in the middle of Harvard square, just walking down the road. Like they own the place, you know? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I actually did a story for GBH a little while ago about one that attacked my car one day. It just was like pecking at my car. And I talked to some people who said that maybe it saw its reflection in the car and was threatened yep. by its own reflection. Yeah, you know, yep, that's what happens. The, like you, actually, I grew up in Connecticut as well and we never saw turkeys, but we saw back then that you never see now are pheasants. There were a lot of pheasants when I was growing up in Connecticut and, and they seem to be gone. Yeah, yeah, and that's a... a very different story. The pheas pheasants are not native to North America. They're introduced from Asia. Um, and they were introduced for hunting. And um, the habitat that they prefer is sort of uh, grassy areas with scattered shrubs. Um, so fields with brushy hedgerows or uh, fields that have been left for a couple of years without being used. So there's grass and weeds and bushes growing up. That's that's prime pheasant habitat. And that habitat has really declined, almost mm. disappeared. Um, as you know, in the last 50 years, um, a lot of farmland has, has turned into housing developments or forest, um, which is good for forest birds, um, but not so good for birds like pheasant. Um, and 
pheasant because it's introduced and the population here was probably always maintained more or less by um, constant releases, more birds being released every year for hunting purposes. Um, it's not clear that pheasant was ever a self-sustaining population in Massachusetts. Um, but a lot of other species like the same habitat and are really um, much rarer now than they were 50 years ago, like brown thrasher, field sparrow, eastern towhee, um, these kind of shrubland birds or second growth successional forest birds um, are, they're a, a target of management now. The state's actually managing some land just for those species because that, that particular habitat has become so rare. So uh, pheasants are gone, but hopefully we won't lose the uh, thrashers and field sparrows and other things from Massachusetts as well. For sure. Uh, Patricia says, asks, are there any uh, other plants and birds that go together? Uh, like if you see a, a, a certain bird, do you always see an associated plant? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, there are, um, but it's not such a, a um, you know, I, I also, I illustrated and wrote a guide to trees of North America. And when I was working on that book, I was, my initial thought was that I would include bird illustrations as well of the birds that were associated with particular trees. And as mm -hmm. the project went on, I just couldn't <laughs> find, for most trees, there isn't a specific bird that is okay. associated with that. There's a lot of sort of general, um, uh, general connections, but yeah, it, birds are connected to habitat and the, the particular plants that are in that habitat, often it's, it's a particular group of plants that are growing there, but um, they'll, the birds will be just as happy in a, a similar looking, similarly structured habitat with a completely different group okay. of plants. Okay. Um, okay. There's a sort of a related question from Sarah who asks, which plants and trees would you like to see more people plant here in Massachusetts for uh, bird food sources? Mm. Well, that's a, a, a very easy but general answer that native plants are the, the things to, to, um, to plant. And the reason is that the um, native plants have evolved in this area with a whole community of insects and other um, other things that uh, uh, that uh, survive on the plant. So, that, and that's all things birds like to eat. So, the birds, an oak tree, say, supports something like 450 species of moth and butterfly larvae. Um, where a Norway maple, that is a European species that's commonly planted that supports something like six or eight species of insects, of butterfly and moth larvae. So the birds that like to eat those little inchworms and other caterpillars, they're, they're gonna go to an oak tree because it's loaded with a big diversity. It'll have food year round or through, through the whole summer, different insects that come and go. And so the, an oak tree is, it, a native plant like that is going to provide a lot more um, food for the native mm -hmm. birds. Mm -hmm. And any native plant is going to provide that benefit. Um, and what you, um, uh, there's a, a lot of information about that online. There's a very good book called Bringing Nature Home um, that describes all this, but a lot of information from Audubon and other sources about native plants that will grow in your area. Okay. I've been planting milkweed for the, the butterflies. I think that's one of the other things we're trying to get more, more of the, the monarchs and they, they need the milkweed. We have a question yeah. from Emily who says, um, after reading your book, uh, what it's like to be a bird, she says, from which I learned so much as, as did I. She said, I was struck by the section about how birds hear and the range of hearing I wondered if there was something here to go in terms of developing a cat collar that would alert birds to their presence. Uh, I was uh, devastated to learn about the number of birds killed by cats. And as a cat owner myself, I'm always uh, uh, attaching all kinds of noisemakers to their collars, but that also alerts larger predators to the cat's presence. 
uh, these are sh strictly outdoor cats. Most live in their bar her barn and other free structures. Um, mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's a great, I love this question. How do you, how do you let the birds know the cat's there without letting the predators know? Yeah. Um, that, yeah, I don't know. Tough one. I know that bell, bells on the cat's collar, the things that are sort of motion activated don't work because the cats just sit still and wait for the mm. prey to come. And by the time the cat's moving and the bird hears the bell, it's too late. Um, uh, and what, well, the, I mean, the question about birds hearing is a really interesting one. And, and I, I did a lot of research on that. And surprisingly, the research that's been done the indications are that birds hearing is it's they have decent hearing but they don't hear as wide a range of frequencies as we do hmm. but they're they don't hear particularly high frequencies um but then that that um that means that some species maybe many species would be singing songs that they can't hear <laughs> And it just doesn't make sense. Wait, um, they would be singing this, songs that their own species couldn't songs, hear or just that they can't that hear are, each other's? Yeah, songs that are so high pitched that their own species wouldn't hear it. It just doesn't make sense. No. But the, the actual tests of birds hearing, which I, I think they're done by uh, kind of monitoring brain, brain waves, um, sort of looking for a, a nerve uh, a nerve signal in the brain saying that a, a signal's coming from the ear, um, they say that there's no reaction to higher frequencies. Um, but it really, it, it doesn't make sense. And a, a bird, there was a recent description of a, a bird song from the South America, a hummingbird that sings at something like 20,000 hertz, which is, we, most, most, people can hear up to eight, 9,000. Um, that's a super high frequency to us. And some young kids and some people with really good hearing hear up to 10,000. This hummingbird is singing at 20,000. And, and then at the same time, they suggest that it can't hear anything above 4,000. Um, it just doesn't make sense. So, um, if the, if the hearing tests are correct, then there's no frequency that, um, the birds hear such a narrow range of frequencies that you wouldn't be able to develop a collar, yeah, a, a sound collar that would, that would work for them. It's a tough um, problem. But yeah, um, and yes, it's, um, you know, really the, the, the best solution is just keeping cats indoors. And I understand the, the tradition of the barn cat and that they're, they're, they're beneficial to have around a barn. Um, uh, but keeping cats away from birds is really the only way, the only totally effective way to keep them from killing birds. Mine doesn't go outside. We keep them in here. With yeah. them. Um, I, I think what you just said about the uh, about the, the research on what birds can hear, what they can't hear, sort of highlights two things for me. One is that there is a lot of important work being done to kind of understand, but also that there's so much about birds that we still don't know, right? I mean, there's 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 a whole world of things, and I think in a way that's one of the things um, that that makes them still so fascinating to 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 pay attention to because we we all can learn from just you know, quietly standing or sitting and, and just, just watching a bird. And, and, uh, and for yeah. me personally, uh, having your guides to, to, uh, to teach me about them, but also to be able to identify them has been a, a, real, a real help and a real joy. And, and, and I'm really grateful to you for that and for joining us today. I, I, I wish we have so many great questions. Uh, I, I wish we could get to them all. Um, and uh, I would say actually probably that a lot, of, a lot of the questions are probably answered in, in this book here. And, and again, if you can make a, a donation to GBH, you'll get a signed copy of it. So uh, please consider doing that. But David, thank you so much for joining us, for being with us today and, and for, for all of your sharing, all your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks to you and thanks to everybody for tuning in and, and for all of your, your passion about birds. Agreed. Thanks again. And thanks to everybody else. Please come back and join us for, for more conversations like this. Take care. Thanks.